Uh, I need just to mention something to you, and for especially the men, I had we had a meeting some time back, uh, almost a year ago, and I told them that uh, there's a possibility of things that could happen in this country. Uh, for example, you know, things that you see happening like in Greece and others, uh, it's because, see, the government has promised to people so much and has taken so much from the people and with guarantees down the road that we're going to take care of you. And then when the government realizes that they can't do it because it won't work, socialism and communism doesn't work. And this is what happens because the people say, well, we paid in, we got a right, we demand, and government's got to come through, and they clash. Well, that same thing is sooner or later has to happen here in America because, see, there's so many people. Uh, see, government can't do anything for you till it takes it from you first, and then it has to give you less back because they have to operate. So you're not ever going to get back what you put in as much. So there's a time coming where it has to collapse because the government can't take care of everybody. And so, but people think, well, well we demand it because it's our right and so they're right, and government promised, but the government is made up by the people who are, and it's going to collapse. And it won't be long before what you see in Greece where police and headgear and riot gear and all that, it's going to happen in America, because it has to, because that's the direction they're going, because people are not willing to correct the problem. They want to just, as they say, kick the can on further down the road. So we have some serious problems. And... Um, I have received several emails from individuals that have tried to make sure that I stay informed about some things that have been promised to come, and they said there's a, a terror threat for the U.S. churches in America, and that because of uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, encourage Muslims to attack religious institutions, Christian churches are being warned. And so uh, this is something that every pastor needs just to let people know that uh, there's always that possibility. Well, it's always existed, but they're making it a, a, a concerted effort to make sure that they do that on anything or anybody that teaches contrary to what the religion of Islam is. So anyway, keep your eyes and ears open, and uh, remember, everybody that comes in here, <clears throat> your one main job is to protect the pastor. I even heard a baby cry. Did I hear a baby cry? <laughs> but anyway, I um, wanted to mention this to you. In the, a movie that I saw one time, it was at the end of it, so I never got the gist of the whole thing. But it had something to do with a, um, a woman who had several sons, and anyway, a couple of them had been killed and they found out that the woman had a couple more sons that was in the service or something. But anyway, it come down to, uh, it was about Saving Private Ryan. Anybody ever heard of that? And uh, cause I, I don't go to movie, but it was on TV one night, and it was talking about uh, the, the part of it. And I, I caught it. And this, this older man was going through the cemetery, and he got to a grave, and he, he kneeled down, and he was kind of like weeping, and there was somebody that was there with him. And I can't remember if it was an adult or a young child or whatever and he's he's crying he said I hope that my life was worth your death something along that line and in the end of that thing it was talking about I think uh, the guy was shot and he was laying up against the wall and and he's dying and he looks at the guy that they were trying to save to get back and he says I hope that you make your life worth it because of how many people had died trying to protect this one guy to get him home. And I thought, this is, to me, it was a, a very moving a little segment of it that I got to enjoy. And I thought, there's a lot of people who have died for our country. And as I've gone around the country, and I've, I'm, I'm not a child anymore, I've, I've been here for a few years, and I, and I see people that have wasted their lives, just wasted their lives. And when they waste their life, it's like the men who died for that individual to live and to enjoy freedom in this country, to waste their life 
is to waste the man's life that died for him. And sometimes people can see this and some people can't see it. Now you and I, when we trust Christ as our Savior, the Lord saving you and giving you eternal life and then giving you the chance to live your life for the Lord. Has your life been worth it? Or have you thrown your life away? I've had to deal with over the years people that have been on drugs and alcohol and other addictions of various kinds. And, and they totally ruined their life. They ruined their health. They ruined their marriage. They ruined their children. They ruined their home. They ruined their job. Everything ruined. And I think the people who died to give us freedom and liberty isn't a shame to misuse that freedom or to misuse that liberty where God has been so good to us. To me, when I trusted Christ as my Savior and I realized what God has done for me, I wanted to serve the Lord. I wanted my life to count for something. I had heard so many times, Yankee, you'll never amount to a hill of beans. Now, I had no clue how much a hill of beans was worth. But I wanted to amount to at least a hill of beans. To accomplish something. To do something with my life. Because you only get to live one time. No reruns. No instant replays. Just one trip through life. And we need to do the right thing while we can. And make your life worth living for something. And I believe it's a, it's a good thing. I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke. The book of Luke. And chapter... 16 Luke chapter 16 now let me just tell you this and I want to be honest with you I'm not going to make this up but there are, there are people in the world and um, and many of them do not mean any harm by it but in their reasoning their reasoning they come to a conclusion that I don't believe is necessarily a correct view to hold and that is and follow my logic because there's universalists or people that believe that eventually, in the future, everybody is going to be saved. And you take like Peter taking those kids out. Well, some people's mind, those kids that they talked about, they would have been saved anyway. See, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe they trusted Christ as Savior because somebody got the gospel to them. And if they hadn't have done it, they may never have trusted the Lord. I believe that if my father-in-law had not talked to me that night when I was 18 years old in that little old living room, nobody may never have witnessed to me again. Because I have lived now almost 70 years, and I've only had one person ever try to lead me to Christ. And that was my father-in-law. And think of all the places I've been, the countries that I've been, and all the churches I've been, all the malls that I've been, everywhere I've been. Nobody has ever tried to win me to the Lord. What about you, Mills? It's, it's amazing that if it hadn't happened when it did happen, it might never have happened. But I'm thankful to the Lord for allowing me to hear the gospel. And he says, how can they hear without a preacher? Somebody to explain it to them. If it wasn't true and not necessary, then having camp is a waste of time. Going so when it is a waste of time. But here's the logic. Since Christ died on the cross and paid for all the sins of the world, then all the sins of the world are paid for, so therefore everybody will be saved. So if everybody's going to be saved, there is an advantage of knowing it now because he says, these things that I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. It's just that when you believe it, you know it, and the other ones are still going to go to heaven and be saved, but they just don't know it. Because they've already paid for all the sins of the world. So, here you are in this room, and let's say, for example, half of you, you know it. And y'all don't know it. But don't worry about it, because you're going to go to heaven anyway, because your sins have already been paid for. It's just that there's more joy in serving the Lord, because when you serve the Lord, you're going to get rewarded. They just miss out. See, y'all just going to miss out, but you're going to go anyway, because he paid for your sins. Now, it sounds like that ought to be right. Christ paid for all the sins of the world, so everybody's sins are paid. 
isn't it true that a lot of time we go out to eat with somebody and we use the illustration? Uh, if, if you get a steak dinner and I get a steak dinner, but you pay for it, well, then I don't have to. Well, if Christ paid for all the sins of the world, well, they don't have to. We say that all the time. Well, then, if they don't have to, then they're not going to hell because they don't have to pay for their sin because it's already been paid. And so there's a, a rationale. And as you listen to me, I hope that I'm not mutilating your mind at this time. But you've got to follow my thinking. And so it comes down to then eventually in the future, nobody will ever go to hell. It, those that do go, it's temporary, but, you know, afterwards, everybody's going to be saved. Because doesn't the Bible say that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father? Well, if everybody's going to bow and everybody's going to confess, that everybody's going to be saved. See there? So we don't have to worry about the soul winning. We don't have to worry about missionaries. We don't have to worry about giving money for anything. We don't have to worry about camp because it's all going to work out in the wash. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be cool. So we don't have to do anything. And there's churches that teach this and believe this. And so therefore, they don't have to have a passion for soul. They don't have to be on fire for the Lord. They don't have to witness to anybody. So it, is a, it can be a deadening effect. But the reason we witness, though, is so that we can have people to know it, to understand it. And it can sound so reasonable. But I want you to take your Bible and look there in the book of Luke chapter 16. Because in my mind, those that do believe that, and there are those, it's not just isolated, one here and one there. No, this is a major teaching. But I believe it's flawed. And uh, I believe this, if I can show from the scriptures where one man goes to hell. It shoots the whole theory out of the water. If I can put one man in hell and keep him there. I can't just get him there. I got to keep him there. To show that even though Christ paid for all the sins of the world, it doesn't mean everybody's saved. It means that everybody can be saved because their sins have been paid for them. But I don't believe that the payment Christ made is put to your account until you believe that he did it for you. So look what he says here in verse 19. There was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named uh, Yankee, uh, Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died. Carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, was buried. In hell he lift up his eyes, been in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So we have two individuals, one rich, one poor, both die. And the Bible says one went to a place of, like, paradise, Abraham's bosom. And a place of comfort. And the other one went to a place of torment. And so we know several things. The man died. He was buried. And immediately he lift up his eyes in hell. So there was no soul sleep. He immediately was placed in hell. So he did go there. But then the object comes up to this. Is that well this is before Christ died. Because Christ is telling the story. But, there's something else about this I want you to see. When he makes a statement there in verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now he is comforted, thou art tormented. One is comforted and one is tormented. But, for how long? How long is this going to take place? I mean, is this until the cross? Or is it going to be after this too? But look what he says. And verse 26, and beside all this, between us and you, there is a great Gothic, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us uh, that would come from thence. Now, there's something that I see here in this verse. One is that if you are in the place of paradise, or Abraham's bosom, a place of comfort, you cannot, you cannot go to the place of torment. You can't go there. And, it's after death, the person that is in hell, torment, 
cannot, and we're talking about the next lifetime because he's already said, in thy lifetime, or that's past. So this is after death, and now after death, that person that is in hell, in torment, cannot, cannot go where the, uh, the Lazarus was. They cannot go to the other place. So there is a man in hell, and that man in hell can't ever go to the place where he is. And it doesn't matter how long it takes place, or if it's before or after Christ died. The truth of the matter is, there is a man in hell, and it's after that he cannot get out, he cannot go anywhere. He can't go to where the place of comfort is. So there is a good possibility that there is a man that did die and go to hell forever. So I believe that I got a man in hell forever. I didn't send him there. I'm just telling that this is the, I believe the truth of the matter. And I don't believe it matters whether or not before the cross happened. This is a person that went to a place and he can't go to the other place. And it's after death. So he can't go there. And there's no other clause in him. But one thing I do want you to see. Is it because he was rich and Lazarus was poor that made the difference? Not exactly. You see there in verse uh, 27. He says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would have sent him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So there's a possibility. He said, I've got five brothers, and I don't want them to come to this place of torment. So I want him to be able to go back and testify. So the testifying, something that they have to say, and something that they need to hear, that will make all the difference in the world. It's not a matter of they had to live a certain way. It's they had to believe the right thing. You see down here, he makes a statement in verse 29. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So in the word of God, it explains how a man was to be saved. Then he says in verse 31, he said unto them, If they will not hear, or hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they, and here's those two words you need to underline in your Bible, be persuaded. The one rose from the dead. Soul winning is persuading someone with the good news to accept Christ as their Savior. That's what we do. This is what it's all about. Because we believe that Christ died for the sins of the whole world so that everybody in the world could have eternal life and go to heaven whenever they die. But it doesn't mean everybody's going to heaven just because Christ paid for everybody's sins. He made a way. But people can reject what Christ has done for them. Now take your Bible and turn over there to the book of Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And look there in chapter 31. Matthew 25 verse 31. This is when Christ comes back to the earth after his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, it's already been 2,000 years, so we know it's uh, been a while. And notice what he says. Now, this is in the future when he comes back with his holy angels and he sets up his kingdom upon the earth and there is going to be the judgment of the nations. And he says in verse 32, And before him shall he gather all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on the right hand, goats on the left. So there's sheep and there's goats. There's saved and there's lost. There's righteous and there's wicked. And this is what he says here in this verse. So there is a judgment that will take place. This is right at the beginning of the thousand year reign upon the earth. Now look what he says there in uh, uh, verse 41. Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Now the ones that go here. Now we're not talking about the devil going there, though it says that. And we're not talking about the angels going there, though the verse says that they go there. He's talking about those unbelievers. He's talking about those 
that did not. And he says, depart from me, ye cursed. This is the goats in the chapter. This is those who have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I get a lost man from these scriptures into hell? And not only get him there, can I keep him there for all eternity? Because if it's true that a man will go to hell and will be in hell for all eternity, then everybody's not going to be saved. It means that there will be people in hell who did have their sins paid for, but they rejected the payment Christ made. They rejected their Savior. They could have been saved, but they rejected. Look what he says. Down in verse 46. And these shall go away into, get this, temporary punishment. But the righteous into life eternal. Now know that there is a difference between the two groups. One is forever. And that one is talking about everlasting punishment, and the other is life eternal. It's two different places, two different groups, two different results, consequences. And what makes the difference is Christ. Now, did Christ die for the sins of the whole world? Or he only died for those that were going to believe? And the other ones, there was... So, there are those who call themselves Calvinists and don't believe that God paid for all the sins of everybody. So you see, you can have error by not believing that Christ paid for all the sins of all the world, but just believe He paid for just a certain group. And He didn't save or pay for the sins of the other. Then you have others that believe He paid for everybody's sins, so everybody's going to heaven. There's error on both sides. I believe He paid for all the sins of the world, but only those that believe on Him have everlasting life. Christ said, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. So there's those who believe, and there's those who do not believe. But not everybody is going to be saved eventually. Because there's those who are going to be suffering, as he says right here, everlasting punishment. Be punished forever. And those who trust Christ as Savior will have everlasting life and live with the Lord forever. And he says, and I'll never cast you out and never lose you. I will be with you always. So there is a difference. And we're not all going to be saved. Don't you believe for a moment that your friends and your mama, your dad, your relatives, your aunts and your uncles and all that, well, they'll be saved eventually. Because Christ paid for everybody's sins and so there are, everybody's going to be saved. It is not true. And you and I need to take it seriously because it's the Bible that says there are those that reject Christ and will spend eternity separated from Him. Now, I want you to take your Bible and turn all the way over there to the book of Jude. The book of Jude. In the book of Jude, right before the book of Revolution, there is uh, an interesting statement found here. And you'll look there in the book of Jude in chapter 1. It's only got one chapter, so uh, if you get to chapter 2, you went too far. But it has to deal uh, with believing and those that do not believe. You see what he says there in verse 7? Look in verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, or set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now here he's using the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them. Now I had <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses. I might as well tell you who they were. They said, yes, yes, I know that verse is in there, but it's not talking about the people, it's talking about the cities. Uh, I don't know why I didn't see that. So the First National Bank committed fornication with the Safeway store. And going after strange cement. They didn't like that. But look what he says. Giving themselves. So we're talking about people. Giving themselves over to... 
fornication. We're talking about the people that were there. And God said, are set forth for an example, get this, and you ought to underline this in your Bible, suffering, that's present tense. Suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal fire. So this was written, you know, 2,000 years ago, and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 years before this. And they're still there. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So is it possible that Christ died on the cross and paid for the sins of the world? And at the same time, there's people who reject that payment? See, don't you believe that people are going to be saved anyway? It won't matter. Nobody's going to go to hell. I actually believe that there's Christians who don't believe that their loved ones are really going to go to hell. They never witness. And I talk to them, and they have, they have no concern. No, they, they love them. They want them to go to heaven. But they never find a way. They never talk to them about the Lord. I've talked to husbands and wives that know the Lord, and they never ask their husband or their wife if they're going to heaven or not. I can't fathom that. I, I just, it just blows my mind. Listen, if I love my children, pray tell, why wouldn't I want to know if they're going? Wouldn't you ask them? Wouldn't you want to find out if they've trusted the Lord? Or do you believe, well, they're going to go to heaven anyway. You know, Christ died on the cross, paid for everybody's sins, and eventually everybody's going to go to heaven. I don't believe nobody's going to go to hell. They will go to hell. That's what makes it so serious. If it wasn't serious, then take your Bible and throw it in the trash and do whatever we want to do. But we're not supposed to play a game. It's not, we're not supposed to be hypocrites. If this is true, then it's true. People will go to hell. People are lost. Uh, look what he says there in verse 13. Where it says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, get this, to whom? is reserved the blackness of darkness for how long? It's forever. It's not temporary, it's forever. Whoever they may be, but we're talking about people. You, how do you know that? We'll look at that very next verse. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these. These that will be like wandering stars forever and ever in the blackness of blackness. This Enoch who lived before the flood says, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now you won't turn in your Old Testament and find where Enoch preached one message. But the Bible tells us that he did. And if he knew about Jesus Christ coming in power and great glory, how much more did he know? He had to know a lot more than that one little line. He'd have had a short sermon. But I believe he probably knew as much as what we know today. Except we just have the scripture. But I believe God told them things that were never written down. But they knew. And it, just like whenever you read in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11. How that the Bible talks about how Moses choosing to suffer affliction with the children of God. Rather than the people of Egypt. And it says that he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Well, how did he know about Christ and the treasures? How did he know all of that? Evidently, they knew things that's not in the Scripture. Because you go back to the Old Testament, you don't see where he, where did he know all of that? Or it's, it's in there and we just ain't seen it yet. But to whom is reserved the, mist, uh, the blackness of darkness forever? And get what God said. That when Enoch preached back then, he says to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and have all their hard speeches, which they uh, ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their words speak of great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved... Remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ and blah, 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 blah. Uh, is he talking about people? Talking about people. People that are going to be suffering the vengeance of eternal fire forever. In the midst of blackness. Forever. You think it's going to be, you know, you go to hell, well, hell, fire, fire, light. Hey, everybody's going to see everybody. Hey, there's Joe over there. Hey, there's Peter Motto. Hey, there's, you know, 
No. It's going to be blackness. There's no light there. There's no light. Hell is going to be dark. And it says in verse 23, because in verse 22 it talks about having compassion. Having compassion. Making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. You see, everybody is lost, condemned, and going to hell. And God tells us to go into all the world and to do what He came to do, to seek and to save that which was lost. And so as we seek, every man I win to Christ, I pull him out of the fire. I win this kid to the Lord, I pull him out of the fire. I win that waitress to the Lord, I just pull that one out of the fire. These that went soul winning, they just pulled him out of the fire. They're making a difference because of compassion. You see, but if I just believe that everybody's going to be saved anyway, then why should I have compassion? Why should I want to make a difference? For 51 years, I've wanted to make a difference. Because when I trusted Christ as my Savior, then I thought, everybody ought to know this. Everybody ought to know this. And I have no desire to slow down. I'll slow down when I can't go. When I get old like Mel, then I'll slow down. By the way, I am older than Mel. But I want you to take your Bible and look in the book of um, Revelation. The book of Revelation. In chapter... Oh, what's a good chapter? I don't know. There ought to be a good chapter in here somewhere. Look in chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And look in verse 10. Verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. It means it's not diluted. God's going to pour out His wrath. And see, when you read in the book of um, John chapter 3, verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath life, and he that believeth not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. Those that do not believe, the wrath of God will abide upon them. This is the wrath of God that he's talking about, saving us from. So he says here, and he says, The wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented, get this, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for how long? Forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night. And this is after, after they die. Forever and ever. So you see, if you can just get one man in hell, it disproves the theory that even though Christ paid for all the sin, that payment he made can be rejected. God does not save anybody against their will. God does not and will not force anybody to trust Christ as their Savior. If a man chooses to reject that payment Christ made, that man is going to spend an eternity in hell. And not because he has to, it's because he chose, he rejected the only way out. And I believe that most people think, and I, you can talk to people, uh, and a lot of times I open up a conversation this way. I, I do it a lot of times. I say, can I ask you two questions? One, isn't it true that you've heard most of your life that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for all the sins of the world? And most of them say, well, yes. Well, if they've heard that, do they automatically believe, well, I'm going to heaven, he paid for all of my sins? They don't automatically believe it. And then I asked them, but if he paid for all the sins of the world, have you ever wondered why you would have to go to hell and pay for sin if he paid for all? There is a reason why a man would still go to hell. Because he rejects the payment Christ made. Because he will not believe that he did it for them. If you believe he did it for you, then that payment he made is put to your account and you get to go to heaven on what Christ did for us. See, all of us in this room that know we have eternal life, the only reason you know you're going to heaven you know it's not by your works. The only reason you know is because you believe you're going. 
because you believe it. You believe you're going to heaven because you believe a promise that he made. And the promise is twofold. One, we should believe what he said and what he did. You see, what he did was pay for all the sins of the world, and what he said was, if I would believe it. i got to believe it. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth shall not perish. That means he won't go to hell. He won't, per he won't go to hell if he believes. Take your Bible and turn there, because I want you to see this very quickly. Over there in the book of Romans and chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And you'll notice there in uh, verse 21, a good definition of what faith is. Where he makes a statement, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Why do I trust Christ as my Savior? Because I believe that he is capable of performing what he promised. He will save me. You see, I could trust males to take me to heaven, but I don't believe he can do it. I think he'll come up short. I asked this one girl one time, I says, why, why do you, you date this short guy? She says, better to date a short than not a tall Now, there's wisdom somewhere in there. Yeah. Look at verse 22. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness, put to his account. Verse 23. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we what? If we believe. See, his righteousness that we need to go to heaven on is not imputed to you or put to your account till you believe that he did it for you. So he made a payment so that you could have eternal life. But you must believe it, that he did it for you. And when you believe he did it for you, he puts that payment to your account. He imputes his righteousness to your account. And you get to go to heaven on his righteousness, not your righteousness. See, he can't impute his righteousness to you with your sins. He had to pay for the sins, but that doesn't give you righteousness. That doesn't make you perfect just because he paid for the sins. The righteousness can't be imputed to you until the sins were paid for. It's so clear in my mind, but something's not able to get across to some people. They don't see it. And yet I believe it's the most important thing. Uh, very quickly as we close, look here in Revelation in chapter 21. Excuse me, Revelation chapter 20, my, my first mistake. In Revelation in chapter 20, we know that the devil is cast into the lake of fire. And it says that the beast and the false prophet are still there. So they have already lived their life. A thousand years has passed and the devil is cast where the beast and the false prophet are. And those were the two men that were up on the earth, the head of the last world government and the religious leader. So here he makes a statement in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. So there's the book of living and the book of life. The book of living, your name can be blotted out. But the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, it cannot be blotted out. For example, in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, in the, uh, this is the book of the generation of Adam, in the day that God created him. And he lived so long, and he died. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. That's the Lamb's book of life. And in that genealogy, there's no deaths. So there's two books, Genesis, Adam, they all die, book of living. Here, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. And that's why he says, rejoice that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, he says, you cannot have your name blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. Moses prayed that he could be blotted out of the book of living. Two different books. When you get to heaven, God says, all the lost people are going to have to stand, and there's two books. And the books will be open. 
and it has in that book all their works that they have done. And they will be judged by their works. Because you see, they wouldn't accept the payment Christ made. They didn't want salvation by grace. They think, I don't need His payment, I don't need His grace, and therefore by their works, and God will show that He is just. And every one of those people that are condemned for all eternity, that God has kept a record. And by their works, they are condemned. By their words, they are condemned. By their thoughts, they are condemned. And then he says, the book of life. And it says there in verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast where? To the lake of fire. So there's those that will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, that lake of fire, they will be cast into it forever and ever. See what it says even in verse 14? Death and hell, those that were judged, that came this is after they've been resurrected, and death and hell means the death, the, the bodies that were in the grave and the souls that were in the place of torment, they'll stand before God. And those same people, those same people that have already died, are going to be cast into a hell. And this is after they've already died once. That's why it's called the second death. When they were separated from their body and from this life, and then when they're separated from God for all eternity. And that's why he makes a statement there in verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's why we often say, if you're born twice, you'll only die once. But if you're born once, you'll die twice. Don't that make sense? New mathematics. It's that new math they got out, I guess. I don't know. Look up here. I know I'm going to heaven. Because, because, because... I believe on Christ because I have trusted him as my Savior. And I believe that if a man has not trusted Christ as Savior, they will not go to heaven. And they will not be forgiven in this life, nor in the one to come. This is why when you read the book of Luke in chapter 16, that once they're dead, they can't go from one place to the other place. So the person who dies without the Lord can't ever go to the other place. I believe the scriptures are clear. Look up here. This hand represents you and me, and the wallet represents sin. We all have sin on us. God says that he loves us, but he hates our sin. And for us to pay for that sin, eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But God loves us, wants us to go to heaven and spend eternity with him. But you see, heaven is a perfect place. And to go to heaven, you've got to be perfect, because God is perfect and heaven is perfect. But because of sin, can't get in. So the Bible says you cannot earn eternal life. You cannot work your way to heaven. That's why Christ died. Because there was no other way. You'll never be good enough to go to heaven. So Jesus Christ, God's Son, had no sin. He came into the world because He loves us. He hates our sin because it separates us from Him. So Jesus Christ, who had no sin, didn't have to die, but because he loved us, he took our sin, paid for them on the cross, came back from the dead. And God said that if you and I, if we would believe, he did it for us. He would put that payment to our account, and we get to go to heaven on what he did. There's no tricks to that. See, if I offered you my microphone and you accept, you'd have a microphone. If I offered you my Bible and you accept, you'd have a Bible. If I offered you my wallet and you accept, you'd have an empty wallet. Now, if Christ walked in here and offered you eternal life and you accept it, well, you'd have eternal life. If it's eternal life, it would last forever. And if it lasts forever and all your sins are paid, then where would you go when you die? To heaven. So can you know you're going to heaven before you die? Yes. That's what makes it good news. It's free. And you can have it now. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around, if you've never trusted Christ as your only hope of going to heaven, would you do that right now? I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you, but right where you're sitting. You say, preacher, that made sense to me. I want to be certain I'm going to heaven. I don't want to run the risk of waiting until I die. Find out it's all true and then I've been messed up. But why not right now? Just the best you know how. Say, Lord, I believe Christ died and he paid for my sins and I'm going to trust him as my only hope of going to heaven. See, friend, God knows if you believe it. 
He knows if you believe it. He knows if you don't believe it. So you can fool people, but you can't fool God. And this is between you and him. So if you will trust Christ as your Savior, I'd like to know it. And I'd like to have a word of prayer for you. But I don't want to embarrass you, so I do it with head bowed, eyes nice closed. I'm not going to have you forward. But right where you are, if what I said made sense, you say, yes, preacher, that did. And I'll trust Christ as my Savior. Friend, would you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Just slip it up real quick, put it right back down. It went all. Our Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us. Help us, Lord, to understand the importance of this message so that we would have something that challenges and motivates us because that's why we need compassion. That's why we want to make a difference. And we do want to pull people out of the fire. Thank you, Lord, so much for these that went so in the other night and others that witnessed on their job, those that plant seeds all over by passing our tracks. And, Father, we just thank you so much for those many that indicated they would trust you. We thank you for this time together. And bless camp. Help us get all the things done that we need to.